Welcome to the laboratory. Today I'm going to introduce you to some of the glassware and equipment you'll be working with, show you how to use it safely, effectively, and maybe save you some time in the lab. It's important to use the right equipment for the right task, specifically when you're concerned about the accuracy of your experiment. When students first enter the laboratory, many of them feel the need to wear gloves all session, and that's really a waste. You should wear gloves when doing so will protect you from exposure, stop your skin from staining, or otherwise harm you by direct contact. Undisciplined use of gloves can actually be problematic, where if I was to touch a harmful chemical uh, and then with my contaminated gloves go and touch commons such as cabinets, pens, equipment such as scales, or even my own face, I risk contaminating those things that other people may handle without gloves on. Once finished, make sure to dispose of gloves properly. Don't leave used gloves on the bench because you will contaminate the bench. Dispose of them in the clinical waste containers and never use gloves around an open flame. So beakers are some of the most common glassware you'll find in the laboratory. They're nice because they come in a variety of sizes and they're good for short-term storage of chemicals. What that means is if I have a nice expensive stock of chemical, I really don't want to stick anything into there that might potentially contaminate it. So what we can do is we can take that stock bottle and just pour out into a beaker and use that as our working solution for the experiment. Beakers are also nice because they're very easy to clean. There are also test tubes and soda glass vials, which you'll use throughout your experiments, but they essentially serve the same function as beakers and they really don't warrant their own discussion. A lot of the time when you're working in the laboratory, what you may find is you wind up with solutions that are colorless and odorless, and there's no real way to differentiate between them easily. So rather than risking confusion if you were to misplace the stocks, what you can do instead is label each of them. And rather than writing on the glassware directly, which just means more cleaning later, I would recommend getting some paper towel and drawing small labels that include the chemical name and the concentration, and then just put them in the right spot each time you use them, put them back. Next up we have the conical flask. It serves essentially the same function as the beaker, but because of its shape it has some additional benefits. If I were to swell the beaker a little too vigorously, it's quite easy to spill. However, swelling the conical flask, because of its shape, resists that same spillage. The difference in design is most significant when working with boiling liquids. In this demonstration, the conical flask is able to retain more of the boiling liquid because the narrow neck allows evaporated gases to hit the cooler upper walls of the flask where they recondense and drip back in a liquid state. So there are two main types of funnel you'll find in the laboratory. The first is the glass funnel and the second the plastic. And the main difference between them is really only the size of the neck. You can use the glass funnels to transfer solids, but unless the funnel and the solids are both incredibly dry, you risk blocking up the neck. What we can use instead is a simple piece of scrap paper, which you can find at the front of the lab. And if you just curl it like this, you can make a funnel with a large entry and a small exit. An important skill in first year labs is weighing by difference. The first step is to come and get a rough measurement on something like this bench top balance. And you may notice that the reading is not zeroed initially. So what we want to do is grab our container. I'm using a soda glass vial stick it on the top and hit re-zero, or tear, depending on your scale. That tells the scale that there's essentially nothing on the balance, and anything we add into our vessel is going to be the mass that it measures. It's very important to take these vessels off of the scale, because if you spill anything directly onto it, that is mass that's not accounted for within your container. So I've got about 3.4 grams here, roughly. Next we bring our sample over to the analytical balances. These are very, very sensitive scales that are even detecting the micro changes in air pressure in here. So you'll see that they have several doors and it's a requirement that you close all of them before you start any measurements. Now, when you come to the analytical balances, the first thing you wanna do is re-zero the scale or tear the scale. And once that's done, we can stick in our sample. And the first mass we're going to record is the mass of the vial plus our total sample, which in my case is 0.9062, and I'm going to write that number down. Don't worry if this number fluctuates, that's not too important. Next what I'll do is I'll take my sample out, make a quick solids funnel, and transfer that solid into my destination vessel, like so. You might notice that, oh, a bit more, you might notice that there is a significant amount of dregs left in here. So what I need to do now is to reweigh the vial plus the remnants, those dregs, because those are not actually anything that I've transferred over to my reaction vessel. So reweighing, uh, I get 10.6181 grams. And taking the difference of those two numbers will give me the exact quantity of solids I've transferred to my final reaction. Next up we have volumetric flasks. These are used to very accurately measure a specific volume of liquid. You can see it's determined by the label on the front. 
It's very important when you use volumetric flasks that you pick the correct lid. For example, this blue lid, if I stick it in the top, it rattles around. Uh, it's important that the lid is very snug because as soon as you were to invert this with any liquid inside, you would have a spill. So the way we fill these is I'll take my funnel and fill up to the top of the bulbous part of the volumetric flask. And then I'll take out the funnel, stopper it up, and begin inversion. I do that by placing my palm on the top and bottom and just inverting like so. Once we can see that our solids are adequately dissolved, we can fill the remainder using a squirt bottle filled with deionized water. Always remember that anything that goes into your reaction must be deionized water to prevent any impurities. And I know I'm at the top because there's a mark in the neck, and I want to make sure the meniscus of the liquid sits right on that mark, so just a tad more. Measuring cylinders are fairly straightforward. We use them to measure liquids with a reasonable degree of accuracy, and it's important when you're using them to measure from the bottom of the meniscus. When we want to transfer liquids from one place to another, we can use pipettes. This is a transfer pipette, also known as a pasture pipette, and they're used in conjunction with these orange bulbs. All we need to do is gently twist the bulb onto the end, then we can squeeze the bulb, place it into our liquid, let go of the bulb, move it across and squeeze again to dispense. When we want to dispense larger volumes of liquid or measure them accurately, we can use these volumetric pipettes. And just like before, we fill them up to this mark. They're used in conjunction with these bulbs, when we want to attach these two pieces together, we need to make sure that we don't hold too far down the volumetric pipette because this places a lot of stress on the glassware joints here and here and it's very easy for it to break. So we want to hold nice and close and just do a gentle twist. This pipette bulb has three valves. The one at the top is marked air, the one in the middle is marked suck, and the one at the E is marked empty. So similarly to the other pipette bulb, I would simply hit the air valve, squeeze air out, put the tip into my source liquid, hit the S for suck, you see the bulb refills, and it would suck liquid up to this mark. Then we transfer over and we hold the empty valve to empty at our destination. Burettes are used to measure stepwise additions of volume. They're most commonly used in titrations. And before I jump into how to use one, first I want to show you the setup that you'll need. Here you have a retort stand and a burette clamp. So you'll see that one side has these rubber holders and the other has a screw. Make sure you always screw onto the metal rod of the retort stand. And then the burette itself clamps into these rubber holders. We have two types of burettes that we use here commonly in the lab. The first has this tap handle that when in parallel with the burette lets the liquid flow through and when perpendicular stops the liquid uh, in between adjusts the flow rate. The second type is a simple screw tap where loosening it increases the flow rate. It's important to realize that when you have the screw tap, it's difficult to see from a glance which position you're in. When we want to fill our burette, it's important to first take away any reaction underneath, just in case we have any spills. So what I'll do is remove that and put a waste beaker in there instead. The next thing I need to check is that my valve is closed. And it's currently in the open state, so I'll close it. Then we will use a small plastic funnel. If I was to use the glass funnel, you'll see that Putting that in, it's quite a, quite a snug fit. It rattles a little bit, but not much. And when you start filling towards the top, you'll very easily get spills. So I'd recommend using these smaller funnels. Stick that into the top, and then you can begin to fill. Now, before we start titrating, it's important to note that there's a small void volume down here where the liquid has not yet gone because we had our tap closed. So with the waste beaker underneath, just run that tap open for a few seconds until all the air bubbles leave. Then we can replace that with our reaction and always take out this funnel from the top because if it were to drip in any liquid during your titration or whatever you're using your burette for it would be a volume of liquid you've not accounted for in your experiment. So that's it for this short introduction on how to use some of the equipment in a lab. As the weeks progress we will give you more detailed explanations on how to do the experiments but this should be enough to get you started with the basics. So have fun!